Brand from the Sunday Business Post. To my right is Liv Bory, a poker pro of uh, quite some renown and uh, an awful lot of other skills, which we'll get to over the course of the next 20 minutes. And beside Liv is uh, Dominic Mansour, who is the chief executive of a little company called Full Tail Class I checked. So I'm going to start, start off with uh, Liv. Liv, now, I think most people in this room know what poker is. So what I'm going to really ask for you is, how did you end up becoming a pro poker player? Um, so I had, I had just graduated university. I, I, my degree was in physics with astrophysics. And my goal at the time was to go straight into a master's, PhD, and so on, become a research scientist. But after that summer, I decided I'd been working a little bit too hard. And I wanted to take a gap year. But I didn't want to get any kind of real job. So I started applying for TV game shows. And one of the game shows that I got on uh, taught, took five complete beginners and taught them how to play poker. And I just fell in love with the game immediately and learned more about the industry and saw how you could, you know, it was a lot like many other sports industries where you'd have celebrities and you could live kind of a rock star lifestyle and that was very appealing to me. So. Now, you, you mentioned you, you, you won a bit, you did okay. You won a European Poker Tour event, of course, San Remo in 2010. Now, people kind of go poker, they've heard certain big winnings, all that. How much have you made in poker? What, what's your t biggest winning been? Uh, my biggest win was the, EP, the European Poker Tour in uh, 2010 for 1.25 million euros. Not bad. That'll yeah, do. It, was, it was a good week, definitely. You could afford a hotel for the Web Summit with that money. Yeah, <laughs> just about, barely. Um, and yeah, I, on paper, I've, I've won and just, just around $3 million. Lifetime. And you've gone into so many other areas as well, which we're going to get to later on. But uh, one of the things I want to know is poker players like, who are pros, it is, it's your job, so focus. So when you're prepping for an event, like when you were prepping for San Remo, when you won it, like, what was the process like beforehand to make sure you were focused and could stay on your game throughout? Uh, well, it's very, very important, as tempting as it may be, uh, to get an early night the night before, um, wherever you are. You know, there's always parties going on in the poker scene. It's a you know, very vibrant social life. Uh, so it's important to go to bed early the night before. Um, I like to meditate, do some yoga, um, anything that sort of calms your emotions as much as possible. Um, the key to sort of successful poker play is to make as many rational decisions uh, as possible and under, be aware of your emotions uh, and not necessarily fight against them, but learn how to work with them and just be in tune with yourself and know when you're at, sort of deviating from, from rational thoughts, I guess. And of course, now you're, you're best known what you've done at the table, but Dominic, Online, of course, has really exploded poker as a phenomenon. It brought ideas, concepts like the World Series really to the attention of a much wider audience. So the online sector for you guys, because obviously you've been in the game quite a while, it's, there's a lot of players in it, a lot of players, companies offering contending products which to the immediate eye of the consumer are fairly similar. So how for, does a company like Full Tilt really get out there and get above the noise? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, from, from a brand like ours, we play the marketing game that everyone else plays. And, you know, I've personally got a background that is in marketing and has been since, you know, the late 90s. You know, how do you stand out? This is essentially, you know, at the end of the day, whilst the game is poker, we're a technology company. Uh, what we have to do is drive the technology fast. We have to be innovative. We have to be quicker than everybody else. Get those new games, get the new innovations into the marketplace first and faster. And when we do that, we see an immediate response. It self-markets itself when you're that good at the, the technical side of it. And if you can't compete on the technology, then you might as well just forget it from, from the business side of it. And obviously on the business side, the sector as a whole had a few rough years at the turn of the decade, but the interest still stayed there from the, from the consumer. Yeah, the interest is still strong. Um, poker is a huge, I mean, online gaming per se is a massive, massive sector. Um, it's growing every single year by insane double-digit growth percentages around the world. Poker itself has struggled a little bit with some of the changes that happened in the, in the regulatory environment. But now that that's all settled down, we're starting to see the thing growing again. And it's a, you know, to, give you a, to throw a number at you, our group alone has over 100 million registered players on the database. Well, like you mentioned how it's getting more competitive because you know, most people here are thinking you know, poker, very high skill game, very mental, intellectual. But when it comes to ads to spend by consumers, you're competing with Candy Crush. Yes, absolutely. And we're competing with media space in the same way as you know, any other uh, entertainment pastime that people have. So one of the things we've noticed recently is how uh, consumer behavior is changing with 
the onset of mobile usage, mobile gaming, um, other types of platforms like Steam. And to be totally honest with you, I'd never even heard of Steam this time a year ago. And when I looked on the website and I see 125 million users, uh, and at the very moment in time I logged in, there was 15 million active at that instant. You go, my God, this world is moving at an insane pace. And not only have you got to keep up with that, but you've got to stand out from the crowd too at the same time. And obviously, Liv, you obviously play online as well with Full Tilt. For you as a player, like, what's, what's the difference in the experience to being at a table, being able to look down whoever you're taking on, versus being in a room where, you know, in your own laptop, wherever you are, or on your phone, and you don't know what the other person is doing? Uh, I mean, yeah, there are the sort of obvious pros and cons. Um, if you particularly enjoy the, the sort of social aspect of poker, then, then live poker is obviously great for that, because you get to, you can make make new friends, make new enemies, maybe. Um, you get Many to look enemies some... live. Uh, no, I try not to. Maybe, maybe a few sure? now and then. Uh, maybe. There's a room full of people who want to know who your enemies are. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the social dynamic of it, um, it can be very, I, I love that. I, you know, I love sitting down and being able to look someone in the eye and try and read their physical posture, you know, looking for the heart rate, breathing rate, that kind of thing. Um, Whereas online, um, well, this is the thing, that they're, they're not that fundamentally different. The game is the same, you know. So in order to be a great uh, live poker player, you really need to be a good online poker player and vice versa because the, the maths is the same, the game theory is the same. Um, and the very best players are the ones that actually come from the online, the online background because you get, to play, uh, you get to play more hands at a faster rate. And so you get to practice all these different decisions. And it, that's what poker is all about. It's about making the most profitable decisions as often as possible. Uh, and plus, being able to just sit at home and play in your pajamas is the best thing ever. So. <laughs> I, I often work with a blanket on, so I can appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but you mentioned about sort of the, the maths and the being able to make the right decisions part. I've just got to go off on a slight tangent here. I assume you've seen Casino Royale. I have, yes. How annoyed were you at the poker scene in that? It's ridiculous. So people who don't know, you've essentially got four guys for the final all-in, where even the worst hand is one where you're an idiot if you don't go all-in on, essentially. So I suppose that's one of the things. People see this glamorous approach to poker in some respects, that you know, you're, you're, you're in lovely suits, you're in nice nightclubs, or else others have seen the smoky room approach where it's a couple of you know, people who are a bit, shall we say, questionable in their ethics in a, in a, in a den somewhere have, have playing. What's the real lifestyle like? Um, well, I mean, both, both those things do still, they, they, still you know, there are the odd smoky back rooms and so on, if, you, if that's the sort of thing you're into. But j this, these days, the game has become incredibly mainstream. Um, for example, the, the, the poker tours these days are actually, they're, not, they're held in conference centers like this. Uh, or quite often, they're held in very like, glamorous hotels, um, historical buildings, for example. Um, there's the Poker Stars European Poker Tour, which is the richest poker tour in the world. And that one, uh, I mean, they've, I think last year they had eight, 800 live tournaments, over 150,000 uh, individual players, and, well, total players, over two, two and 2.15 million uh, dollars in, in prize winnings. And so it's, I don't know, some people dress up, so, some people, uh, no one's in their pajamas, fortunately, but it's, it's very <laughs> sportified. You know, the hours are very long, so people will dress, dress for comfort, but uh, it's taken very seriously. And, uh, well, it's, it's not just about the table when you're down there or the computer when you're playing with it. Like, there's the entire prep as well, because like, your degree is in astrophysics, like you were saying, you were planning on being a research scientist, and there's a lot of people with mathsy backgrounds who are at the higher end of poker, really. Like, that, that's the type of skill you need, effectively, to be good at it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's... At the very highest levels, yes, you, you do need to have... Um, I mean, you, don't, you definitely don't have to have a maths degree or anything, but you need to enjoy number crunching and, and post-game analysis is definitely a part of it. But for the most part, for beginners and by f like 98% of it is, uh, you, you know, it, the, the mathematics is actually very simple. Um, it's basic odds and so on. And, and more of it is about understanding sort of decision trees. And it's, it's a game of logic more than anything. And it can teach you a lot of things from that. I suppose on the upside of that, uh, um, although please, please, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on this, I'm guessing it's probably a bit more of an egalitarian type sport in that respect. That for you as a woman player, it may not be too challenging, or are there still barriers to you being in there? You know, in terms of you know sexism and the likes. Um, it is definitely a male-dominated game at the moment, but that's getting better year on year. Um, in terms of sexism, I've personally experienced very, very little. Um, maybe 
perhaps behind my back that they don't say it to my face, but I really don't think so. You know, long gone are the days of, you know, the 80s and 90s where, where women would not be welcomed at the table. It's quite the opposite. And uh, I personally think there's actually a lot of advantages for being a minority in, in an industry because, I mean, it gets you noticed more. And again, just for a pure gameplay perspective, uh, if someone is foolish enough to judge a book by its cover and you know, say, oh, see a woman sit down and have a preconceived idea of how she's going to play, well, that means they're not actually paying attention to the way that they're playing. And you can take them apart in the table. Sorry? You can take them apart in the table. Exactly, yeah. They're Brilliant. either, either going to think that you're scared, so you can, uh, you can take advantage of that and just bluff them all the time, or they're going to think that perhaps you're better than you are as well, um, so you can, you can scare them. Um, there's, there's lots of little ways you can use it to your advantage. And Dominic, I'm guessing the online side of poker as well has really opened up the market to people who, not just in terms of like, you know, different, different groups of people, but people who just wouldn't have considered you know, gambling before because the idea of walking into a room to play, that was kind of a barrier to them. You sort of broken down that barrier for a lot of players, I, I, I think. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier, that there's a certain intimidation factor to a real life poker table in a casino or something. You know, you, even often if you just go through the more welcoming ones in Vegas, you'll, you'll sit there and go, oh my God, you know, these guys aren't talking and they don't even look. Some of them sit there with their, hood, you know, their hoodies on and their headphones on and, and dark glasses. And, you know, that is not a welcoming environment that a new guy wants to sort of participate in real life poker. That, I think, is where online has bridged that gap yeah. really nicely. So you can learn the rules. In fact, half the rules are taken out of your hands online because it, it presents the decisions to you. Whereas when you're playing in real life, you've got to know what the, the options are available to yourself. So when you play online, you get that, build up that skill set, build up your confidence levels, and, as, and do so at, at, at micro stakes, for example, which is one to two cent per hand. You know, it's nothing, it's peanuts. $10 could last you a few hours. And then take that skill that you build up and put it into the real life world mm. where you get those other benefits of interaction with people, reading their body language and so on. And like the sort of skills you build up, like it doesn't just affect poker as well. It's like what you learn at the table, I'm guessing, and this is for both of you, I'll start with Dominic. Like it can translate to other parts of your working life, I'm thinking. Well, funnily enough, I keep saying that, you know, for me, it's not the business of poker, it's the poker of business. And I, you know, whilst I run a poker business, I'm just another businessman who sits in meetings negotiating with people. My negotiations are a process of it's, I'm, I have a hand of cards, I have a series of things I want, I'm strong in my hand or I'm weak in my hand, I may need to bluff in a particular moment, I may need to play really aggressively or aggressively when I'm behind in a particular moment. So they're all actually things that you're learning when you're playing poker, funnily enough, in day-to-day -day life that is just surrounding you at any one moment. Yeah. And live? Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, on top of that, uh, one thing it really teaches you is how to control your emotions. And I mean, we all know how important it is if you're in a big business negotiation and you know, someone throws out an insultingly low offer, it, it can throw you, throw you for six or whatever. And, and uh, so learning how to sort of sense, sense how your sort of physiological responses are to, to new bits of information and that sort of thing, um, it, again, it helps you clear your mind and make better decisions. Uh, and, and interesting, there's been a lot of uh, sports stars, for example, that, that have crossed over into poker. Uh, uh, Neymar Jr., Cristiano Ronaldo, um, they, they've been playing, they're now part of Team Poker Stars and they've been playing, having, Boris playing a Becker lot. has not been so good at it. Yeah. Boris, is, Boris is pretty good. I played against him a fair bit. Um, I mean, he, he was pre pretty good when he was playing. He doesn't play so much now. I'd say he's a bit of fun at the table as well. He's a hilarious table. And another example is um, there was an Olympic gold medalist, Fatima Maria de Mello. Um, she won the, when the Dutch hockey team won. I think they always win actually gold. But uh, she, she's really taken to poker and is a fantastic player. And I think she attributes a lot of it to her, her training um, sort of high level competitive sports, long hours and so on, and she's able to just, she, she doesn't get tired and so on. I mean, poker can be quite an endurance game. And As so again, it, it, it's, it's this back and forth. Because like for you, it is an endurance sport. I'm guessing like you've got to you know, train a lot physically as well to keep your body in shape to be able to do it long term. You don't have to, but it helps. Yeah. And there's been a big movement within poker players. Before uh, uh, sort of early 2000s and so on, um, people lived quite unhealthy lifestyles in poker and then a few of the, the, the top players were regularly doing super well and they were 
often in the gym and becoming fitter and fitter, and there was definitely a correlation in that. And so, yeah, th these days, um, there's a lot of focus on, on physical health and fitness. And I mean, you see, it, I've noticed it in myself. If, if I've been having late nights and jet lagged and so on, that, that my, the quality of my decisions drops off uh, later on in the day and so on. So having, you know, having a physical fitness definitely helps. And so Stammer, that's something you probably see with your customers as well. You can tell the players who've been on too long because they don't have the energy they had when they started in the beginning of the day or, you know, something Liv was saying to us before we went out, they might have stopped for a meal and they've lost a bit of energy after that. So I'm guessing you see that with your data analytics and you can actually understand the movements in your own uh, way coming in. Well, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't believe this, but we have regularly players who, what we call multi-table, and a multi-tabler will have three or four huge screens in front of them, mm -hmm. and they'll be playing on 24 tables simultaneously. So that's 24 hands of poker at any one moment that is appearing on their screen. Can you imagine the mental challenge that that takes to be able to work out in a split second what decision you have to make? Because each of those screens will flick up and tell you when you need to make a decision on there. So you're going to have to look at it. You have a moment to decide, should I raise, fold, or, or, or just call? And um, you're going to have to do that nonstop. And these guys are doing it for a living. This isn't the recreational player, which represents 98% of, of our player base. This is people whose job is, I get up in the morning, I go into my study, I fire up my extremely high-powered machine, and I play poker for eight to 10 hours of a day. So yeah, we definitely see, to answer your question, that towards the end of the day, they get looser because their decision-making isn't as good as it was before. That you can see the tiredness, and that's actually great for the, for the game because the less skilled player might have a better chance of winning against these guys who've got all that you know, data in front of them. And I obviously want to ask about how you've taken your skills and brought them to other elements, because obviously you're running a charity, you do a bit of TV. Like for you, balancing it all out, like, I suppose, does poker help you with the, idea, with the outside projects you have, or is there a case of trying to find time for both poker and the other stuff you're doing? Uh, yeah, recently it has been quite a struggle uh, s splitting my time. Um, particularly if I want to keep my poker on, on top form, then you know the very best players, they're always working on their game, analyzing, studying the statistics and that sort of thing. And I just don't have time for that. But it's provided me other things. So, so for example, this, uh, this fundraising organization we created, uh, it's, it's called Raising for Effective Giving, and we encourage, uh, it's aimed at poker players to, uh, to give back, basically, and it's, to, it's built upon the model of effective altruism where, we, where poker players donate to specifically highly effective charities. Um, so that's been an incredibly new learning experience because I, I was fairly new to, to well, to, to charity and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, my, my time is spread pretty, pretty thinly. Uh, on top of that, I'm still trying to get into sort of science TV presenting again and so on. So, uh, it's, it's a juggling act. But. I've got one question for both of you, which I'm going to phrase slightly differently. Starting off at Liv, for you to keep at the top of your game as a poker player, because there's so many, more, so many good players keep on coming on the scene, how do you need to innovate in the future to really stay as you know, a top tier, a top echelon player? <sighs> Um, that's a good question. I, I think, well, for example, there's been a big explosion recently in Twitch poker, and uh, it's essentially a very, it's a great free education tool um, because a lot of the very best players um, are playing playing online and simultaneously streaming it. So they'll do it with a delay so that you know their, their game is uncompromised. But they and they're giving insights into the way they're thinking, and this is absolute goldmine of information of what these great players are thinking. Um, and so, as well as the sort of the normal analysis and so on, I think that's now become an essential part of, of being a great player is watching others and, and trying to assimilate all this information that's now out there on the internet because of, informa of technology. And for Dominic, similar version of that question for Fultil as a company, because you're always going to have competitors out there, you're always going to have people trying to take part of your market share. For you to stay out there, what innovations do you need to make? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the question, actually. And it's not just the, you know, we don't sit down in a room as a management team or an innovation team and sit down and go, okay, what's the next innovation we're going to release, guys? You've actually, to understand what should be released and when to release it and how to release it, it's a bit of an art form, whilst at the same time, I'd love to tell you that we do these massive focus groups and all this big, big research, but we do have a big startup culture there. You know, we have to behave in that way where sometimes you go, guys, 
do you know what, we'll, 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 have, you know, we'll just run with this thing. You know, we, we've done something recently called Jackpot Sit and Goes. There are different variants of poker where there's only three people at a table and the prize pool is randomly selected at the beginning. And depending on your stake level, that could be up to like a million dollars as the top prize or, you know, 100,000 in some instances between just, just three of you. And when that game came out, we couldn't tell you that it was going to end up being 16% of our total revenue this year. Um, in a million years, did we have a clue? You know, we could, have, we could have interviewed everybody in this room who'd ever played poker and said, would you be interested in that? And we'd either have had like a 1%, you know, no one's interested whatsoever, and still released it, it would have been a huge success. So there's just this huge amount of, you know, sometimes you've just got to go with your gut instinct, surround yourselves by poker people like Liv, our developers, our C++ developers, are generally poker players. So we get a lot of this, you know, the, the product guys write the spec up, and there's the people who come up with the idea, and they work together as you'd expect them to do. But then you have the, that gets sent downstairs to the IT guys, and they send it right back up again. And they come back up and go, hang on a minute, that, that, that's just not going to work. And you're like, no, I'm sorry, you're the IT guy, your job's just to write code. But, but that's just not how it works. They come up, they sit down, we have a really good interaction with them, and they'll say, you know, but the reason this isn't going to work is because A, B, and C. And they're game players too. Because they play poker. They love poker. They understand the intricacies. And you, you sit in these meetings, and it's brilliant to watch them bounce it all off and go, oh, I get it. OK, of course, we'll tweak it like this. So the spec, get, you know, rip up, throw it out, and redo the whole thing all over again. Hmm. Now, I can see we've only got about four minutes left. There's one question very much both of you. I want to make sure I get in. When pe I, I used to work in the sector, and people always see the pros associated with the companies, but they don't understand sort of the relationship behind it. Just assume it's like, well, this is a person to the face for that company. But I know myself, my own time in the sector, it's much more than that. So if you guys could explain how the pros work with the companies like yourselves to make the overall product better, essentially. Well, it's a little bit like I was just saying before, but you know, for us, we live as one of many. You know, um, both Full Tilt and Pokestars, we're, we're part of the same group. We've got a lot of pros on our books. But actually, pros is part of our culture. As I was saying, the IT guys, I mean, one of our IT guys I can think of, um, he actually, in his spare time, plays so much poker that he is basically a pro anyway. He's not allowed to play on our site because we just don't let people play on our own site. So he plays on other sites. And he's at the top level of their VIP. Um, you know, so he sits in the meetings. In fact, he even shares his personal data performance on how he's, you know, how he's getting on. So he is our focus group. Liv is part of the focus group. These things get sent around, they get shared with, you know, we, we need that feedback. You know, it's a two-way thing. Yes, we want, you know, the poker stars or the full tilt badge when they're on TV. We want it on the table. We want all of that stuff. That's the boring marketing bit. But what we really need is that much, much tighter interaction with the individuals so that, you know, they become part of what we're doing rather than just a uh, you know, a, a face on a screen. And that's a crucial part of sponsorship these days, not just in poker, but across the board. It's about more than the badge really on the jersey, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw, but we sponsored, Pokestar sponsored Neymar, and um, he actually played in one of our tournaments the other day. I've got a royal flush, which is, I think, one in, in 2.1 million chance of yeah, that happening lot, or something. Yeah. Um, so which was just a great bit of media fanfare. It was brilliant for us, got a load of attention. He needs um, the money so badly. Yeah, he definitely needed the money. Jesus, especially after the money we've paid him. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, Liv, for you, obviously, there's a financial benefit of the relationship. But I'm guessing you, got, you get more out of it as well than just you know, getting paid. Yeah, of course. I mean, not only the prestige, but of course the media coverage. Choose your words carefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I love the, 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 the sort of the TV, the photo shoots. You know, this sort of thing is so much fun um, that you get as being you know, part of a brand ambassador. Um, so that's, you know, that definitely adds variety to the just, just the plain old poker tour lifestyle. Now, I know we're running quite short, so Liv, I want to finish up one question for you, because we have a lot of people here who clearly play poker, who want to get better at poker. They want to hear from one of the best there is. How do they get better? Uh, how to summarize that? <laughs> <laughs> nice simple one question. Sentence. Um, okay. Probably tighten up the range of hands that you're playing. Um, try to play in position, which means act, acting last is is a big advantage. You know, you, it means you have more information on which to base your decision. So play. Fewer hands if you're one of the first ones to act, and you can play wide, a wider range of hands if you're one of the last ones. And the third thing is, if in doubt, whip it out. Be aggressive. Don't just call. If, you, if you're not sure what to do, raising is better than just calling. And have you ever had that go wrong for you? 
all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at least you're honest about it. Uh, Liv Bory and Dominic Mansour, uh, could you have a big hand for both of them, please? Thank you. Thanks, everybody.